Have you, have you noticed that I've got a light shining out of my head? It's, I, you know, I did. It's, I actually thought that was just your natural aura. Well, um, it, um, it is. It, there's no electricity there. No, that's what I thought. He's actually in a dark room, but just his 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 natural incandescent style is just is coming through. So. <laughs> So listen, David. Um, it is absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll go into character now. You see, as, uh, as they say. But uh, it is absolutely fantastic to have you on this episode of Leadership Bites. Welcome. Pleasure. Nice to be with you. I'm glad you said that, and you haven't come on the wrong call. So that's always a good start. So listen, David. I've done a little intro um in on the podcast which i always do just to set the scene um but for those who are watching on video they won't have got that so it's really great just to get a sense of uh who you are what you do and what you focus on be lovely to hear that sure where would you like me to start guy i'm, I'm happy to i'm happy to be as open i as think just the the job that you have now the effort the, the, the roles that you inhabit today uh and then we'll go back into the past but just right now so much there, the the essence of the roles that you inhabit and and, and the the organisations that you work with. Fine, I I, I have to, I have to start with with a couple of thoughts though, if I may. But the, the last time someone gave me a really big build up on stage, and I was thinking, oh, whoever this person is is coming to speak next, it'll be fantastic. I can't wait. I got my notepad out to take notes. I turned out it was me. I was really disappointed. <laughs> and and my my great friend Adrian Furnham, who's one of my co co authors. He always says, you know, he said, David and I, David and I are, are, are called gurus, but only by people who can't spell charlatan, you know. <laughs> so, so I felt crestfallen at that point as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> Self deprecation goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm a psychologist by background. I've spent uh, almost an entire career operating as a business psychologist, um, applying psychology initially to the world of education and then the world of medicine uh, through the medium of communication um, and then into leadership for about the last uh, two decades. I'm now professor in leadership at Henley Business School uh, and I'm also an associate fellow at Oxford as well. Boom. That's, a, <laughs> that's, that's, that's fantastic just there. So and, and that's, that's why I reached out to you uh, for the roles that you inhabit and, uh, and that background. Um, so t t I often say on these things that to hear somebody's journey to the position that they inhabit is a massive part of why I might listen to somebody because they, you know, they bring that experience and that insight th through their own experiences. So, you know, we could all kind of offer our stories, but it'd be great just to have that journey of, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was born in a forest. And, uh, but I made my way, but however you got to where you are today um, and whatever you're willing to offer out within that context bef uh, before I ask you other questions around it, it'd be, it'd be lovely to hear that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, you put me in mind of that, that sort of slightly tearful uh, celebration that Lewis Hamilton had on winning his seventh world championship saying, you know, tell people that they can make it. You know. well, in, in a sense, in a sense, in a much lesser version of it, I, that, that's my story. I, I was born into a into a home in which no one had been to university. Uh, it was a very um, simple, straightforward home. Decent people, love you know, loving parents and all of that. But no one had, had really had the benefit of much education. And yet, my my folks and I'm an only child. My folks really fundamentally believed in education. They somehow thought that that was a a, a route to success. Um, and and so I have this sort of image of my parents, you know, on this little desert island, finding a rowing boat called Education, and they put me in it, and they kind of push me out to sea and wave from the shore, you know, because they didn't know where the hell this thing was going to go. Um, but but everything happened as a consequence of you know the kind of breakthroughs in a life, the eleven plus kind of grammar school, getting to university, getting a degree you know, doing a bit of work, getting a doctorate, all of that. Um, and and I once asked my mum, bless her, she's now long dead, but um, I once asked her, you know, because I'm an only child, I said, mum, you know, of all the things I've done, you know, what are you proudest of? And she said, when you passed your 11 plus. And, and that was, I think, the last time she really fully understood what I'd done. 
uh, because the world that that sent me to was a world that my mum didn't know anything about. And my dad didn't know much about it either, but, but they sort of believed it was good, believed it was okay, and I, it all would be well. So I, I, I went to um, the local university, I went to Nottingham University, uh, I was raised, raised in Nottingham, uh, worked for a few years, got a degree in psychology, uh, worked for a few years, then went to Oxford to do my doctorate, where uh, I met my wife and life took off in a glorious way. I met my wife. In wow. Yeah. I, I, get, I get it. <laughs> so, you know, and she's a psychologist too. All right. Okay. Wow. My kids, you know, you can imagine a complete mess. There. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. My, my kids are another story. It's like the hairdresser with bad hair. So from, um, from d doing a doctorate and uh, moving on into that space, what were the stepping stones to the roles that you inhabit now? Um, so I, having finished, uh, actually, if I, I just go before Oxford, I, I thought I wanted to be an academic. Uh, I decided quite quickly that I didn't want to be an academic. I wanted to do something more applied. I wanted to do something with the psychology rather than just sort of perpetuate the cycle of teaching it. So um, I went to Oxford uh, to do a doctorate on doctor-patient communication because I was really interested in, in medical care and how we could make a contribution to doctors' effectiveness with their patients. Um, and um, so uh, having done that doctorate, uh, I started even whilst doing it to do some part-time work with uh, two organisations. One was the Oxford Regional Health Authority and the other was uh, their vocational training scheme in general practice. Um, and the other was the Royal College of General Practitioners and both of them encouraged me. Uh, um, a guy called uh, John Hasler, kind of a, a very senior medic, um, opened the doors and I, I got access to do the research. Uh, and uh, he uh, he really kind of sponsored and championed me, but through both organizations. And so I was able to put together a job applying what I'd done in my doctorate, which was all about uh, uh, general practitioners communicating with their patients. Um, we were able to build courses and ultimately write books and, uh, and become known for uh, an approach to teaching and learning effective communication in, in healthcare. Uh, and uh, having done that for uh, a number of years, I ended up uh, in a place called the King's Fund College, which was uh, a management school for the health service. It doesn't exist anymore, uh, but it's a, rather an anachronism then. It, it, when King Edward VII was, was uh, building the Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee Appeal, uh, he created a, a fund of money uh, in the Bank of England for the London hospitals, which of course was rendered redundant when the NHS came along in '48. So uh, what do you do with this big pot of money? You can't, you, you can't just give it away uh, because it's there for a specific reason. Um, and so they built the King's Fund College, which was a management school for the health service at the time and uh, a professional development center as well. So I, I worked with them and, and taught uh, managerial psychology in the context of trained NHS managers. Um, and then having done that for a while, I got recruited into um, a business psychology consultancy in, in Bristol. Uh, and after a couple of comings and leavings and joining and leaving, um, I ended up uh, building with my wife uh, our own consulting company called the Edgecom Consulting Group. Um, and I left that five years ago. Ironically, I wasn't going to be an academic to become a professor at uh, Henley Business School. And that stepping stone into leadership is that. Um, is that an obvious step from what you were doing before or, or what, what is that growth that gave you that credibility in that space? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I used to work with a guy called Laurie Thomas uh, at Brunel University who started out as a production engineer and ended up as a psychologist. Right. And he said because he, it's because he noticed that, that an awful lot of production engineering problems came down to people. And so he needed to do something to understand the people bit better. And he ended up as, up as, as a professor of, uh, of psychology. Um, it, for me, it was a bit similar in the sense that I, what I noticed was that um, an awful lot of uh, communication issues were about the context in which the communication was, was happening. And if you wanted to influence that context, you probably had to get into at least management and ideally leadership, because that's what 
creates the context or fashions the context in which people work. Um, and so in a sense, it wasn't a, it wasn't a million miles away. Uh, one wasn't a million miles away from the other. It was a kind of a natural growth, although there was, a, there was a, an element of the knight's move in it, you know, sort of one up and one across. <laughs> <clears throat> okay so that, that, that for, me, for you then that that interest was i have to get to a almost a source space to have an impact because the yeah. the river starts there almost kind of yeah i it, it always seems to me that, that that there are lots of distinctions made between leadership and management and i don't use use them much because i think you always need both mm. but but the, the one that i am i am most impressed by is that is that managers tend to sort of work within the context they're given and leaders try to change it uh and, and i think that that idea took me to if we want to do something about the effectiveness of any organization or professional group you've probably got to touch leadership issues at some point so i so i found myself naturally graduating particularly working with um uh, develop developing nhs managers you know if you're going to make try and make a difference to the nhs you have to get into issues of leadership so your daily focus now if you if you left that sort of space and you've gone into um the role in Henley, etc. Um, are you running programs? Are you doing one-to-one -one work? Are you working with organizational teams? What what's your your day look like in essence? Well, I I, I don't work full time uh, at Henley. I also do uh, some consulting, um, although uh, I'm I'm trying not to work full time anymore. Right. Uh, so. I, I work at all three levels. I work at the individual level, the team level, and the organizational level. Uh, but when I'm working at the organizational level, I'm, I'm usually working with the top team. So you can see that as a team intervention, if you like. Um, because of course, what, I'm, what I've realized is that in a sense, organizations are simply aggregations of people with a business model. Mm. Um, and, and so what I'm trying to do is to influence the human element of that. Um, at Henley, I focus on executive education. Um, I, I asked when, when being interviewed for the job, uh, I said, look, I, I really don't want to teach students. I'm, not, I'm nothing against students, I was one myself. Uh, but, but I want to work with those people for whom there's a short and direct connection between what they learn one day and what they can apply the next. Oh. Um, and so I, I, I'm, um, I'm happy to say that Henley have given me the opportunity of focusing entirely on executive education. So I don't do... I don't teach on degree programs unless I can help it. Um, I, I teach short, intensive exec programs. Um, sometimes I'm the course director. Sometimes I'm a contributor. Yeah. Um, I teach really around three, three major issues. One is leadership. The second is psychology in leadership. And usually that focuses on personality. Um, and the third is about resilience. It's about sort of uh, coping with, with pressure. So for you, the when we say executive education, it's not the how to read a profit and loss tracker or something along those lines. It's very much in that human dynamic and that understanding of self to understand others. Yeah, um, that's my contribution. The exec ed covers all of those things about how to read a spreadsheet, all of that, you know, finance for non-financial managers, all of that is part of executive education in the business school. But you know, I'm a psychologist by background, so not surprisingly, they yeah. wheel me in when you need a tame psychologist to talk a bit about people. And have you noticed any change in? I mean, that's a plug. Let me re, let me restart my question. Um, everything has momentum. If we go back to you know the the, the leader as the, the 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 hero of the piece who you know comes and and controls and dictates and all the way through to now we have this very kind of. Um, integrated approach to leadership about you know you have to work through others etc so i think things have their momentum and i'm always intrigued by the balance between that um the, the autocratic look there are times when you you have to tell people and and also when people want to be told look let's let's not have a debate on this one boss would you just say what's what and <laughs> so we've got clarity all the way through to that you know the shared purpose the giving people boundaries allowing them to take ownership and on that balance between command and control and, and giving people space and place and have you over your period of, of being in this place have you felt that difference do you see it as it's a little bit um 
sometimes it's a little bit on trend or no, I'm actually feeling that people want to operate in a different way. Is that anything that you kind of see notes factor in? I'm smiling because although we didn't prepare this, I just happened to have next to me uh, <laughs> an article, not, not that I wrote, but that Deborah Ancona at MIT wrote. And I'm just going to read you the first two sentences. Nobody has really recommended command and control leadership for a long time, but no fully formed alternative has emerged either. <laughs> I thought that was interesting and relevant, but, but uh, so I'm trying to work on that fully formed alternative. Um, the, you talk about momentum. The, the, I'm, uh, I'm just literally any day now, the third edition of, of my leadership book is going to come out and we've changed the subtitle. It used to be called Leadership. Uh, all you need to know but it's really tough to make that case when you're <laughs> writing the third edition so, so, so what you need to know again, again <laughs> even more of what you need to know. Yes. Um, but um so the subtitles changed we've called it leadership no more heroes okay uh, so it's again relevant to your question um and um and the reason is is really twofold um one is that the you talked about momentum. The momentum on how leadership has developed and changed through the 20th century into the 21st century is a very simple process to describe. It's what I would call simply democratization. At the start of the 20th century, and probably for time immemorial before then, leaders were the pinnacle of authority who simply said what had to be done. And if they were enlightened, they tried to be kind, so that it became kind of paternalistic, and it usually was men, so I won't say parental. Um, what's happened over time is that around the middle of the 20th century, as recently as that, the word vision emerged in, the, in, in research and, and talking and writing about, the, uh, about leadership. You didn't need vision if you're in total authority. If you are the boss and you say, guy, just bloody do this, you know, I don't need a vision. You just need to have clear instructions. You have to go off and do it and ideally touch yours and mine non-existent forelock, you know, in the, in the process. And so what we've, what we've seen in the middle of the 20th century is it's a switch from push-based leadership to pull. So, so if I can describe a vision which is worth trying to achieve, then it pulls us both towards that vision. To, by the end of the 20th, century, we were into much more partnership based leadership. And in the 21st century, the approach to leadership that I'm trying to put together is very much team based leadership. So what I'm trying to say, so firstly, there's a, there's a momentum towards democratization. So shared leadership models are the ones that we have to sort of uh, go to first. Most of the time, I'm going to come back to this, what do you need authority and you do from time to time. But um, the other thing I want to say is that my colleagues and I, uh, business psychologists, uh, we have assessed, particularly at the, at the group that I created with my wife, we assessed probably between us literally thousands of leaders all over the world in every walk of life, in the, in the charity sector, public sector, private sector, commercial organizations, not for profit, the whole lot, the whole gamut. We never found one who was world class in all aspects of leadership. Not one, anywhere. And we've assessed, you know, knights of the realm, people, you know, knighted for this, that, and the other. Um, and we've met some incredibly impressive leaders, but not one of them was complete in all aspects of leadership. None of them were perfect. None of them were perfect, but also, you know, if we, we, we used a five point scale in rating people across all the leadership tasks that we, that we, that we assessed, and we assessed eight of them, uh, derived from the primary colors model that I'm, known for created. Um, but we didn't even find anyone who scored a five, which which is not perfection. You know, it's just it's just being right at the top end of the distribution. But so we didn't find one person who was complete. And so the puzzle is how to get complete leadership from incomplete leaders. Uh, and of course, the answer to that is through working with complementary differences. So it doesn't matter that I'm not very good at planning and organizing, and by the way, I'm not, provided I've got the person next to me who really is. And from time to time, even if I'm the, the, the CEO and I was of my consulting company, I needed other people to organize me. 
because otherwise I sort of tended towards yeah. chaos and Brownian motion. So, so the jigsaw pieces make the make the picture, right? It's exactly that. It's which what's the shape of your jigsaw puzzle piece? What do, what are you really good at? Um, and what do you need other people around you to complete you? Um, and if you can get that sorted out, there's some chance that we can have really impressive, complete leadership, but not on our own. So this is where I think it gets quite fascinating because as a consultant, I spend my life going into organizations at generally a senior level, doing one-to-one -one coaching. I do the team effectiveness and, and I also do those larger scale transformational change projects when I have my team that, that do that. And so I'm, I'm not as um, quite as seasoned as yourself. So uh, in, in terms of just uh, my experience, but uh, still probably two decades worth of experience. And what I what I get is this sense that there is. I don't know if I'm going to use the word excellence, but there are people that are, yeah, you know, who are excellent at their job. And as you say, they're not the perfect human being, but, you know, they have a, a, a bloody good executive assistant, for example, who is actually paid an absolute fortune because that individual needs somebody, as you say, you know, to schedule them because they recognize, you know, that that is not my my space of expertise. So they do have the seniority and the capacity to build a support mechanism around them for them to be for them to be great but then what, what i kind of notice is that there's there's two or three factors going on there are those examples of excellence and then if, what you have is people that due to the nature of the environment have become quite senior in their slipstream so they've been there a long time. They understand how the politic works. They're very good at saying things. I wouldn't say in a Machiavellian way, the right way, but they know what wants to be heard and they know how to present it correctly. So, you know, et cetera. So they become very senior and yet they haven't really developed themselves outside of their, their, their entity. And what I notice is dependent on that sort of nature of, hierarchy within an organization senior teams have this capacity to say we want the car park painted blue be great if you could get the car park painted blue that goes down and very often becomes they want the car park painted blue which goes down and says right we've got to get the car park painted blue by this afternoon <laughs> and there is this kind of the weight of seniority that you know almost that will somebody please rid me of this damned priest, i.e. somebody said something. And at a very senior level, what I noticed, one of the big disconnects is, is their perception of the weight of their words, because they live in quite a strong bubble of wanting to do the right thing. They're full of integrity. They're very vision led. They want to have a culture that they can be proud of. They're not the good people trying to do good things. And yet they are, there's a disconnect between their understanding sometimes of what then happens when their thoughts leave the room and the impetus that gets or the uh, aggression that can be attached to a request. You know, well, I want it by this afternoon for them, you know, and I, and I just wonder how the, the, the learning that you offer or how maybe you overcome or even consider, it's not almost sometimes what they're thinking and doing, it's the people below them. <laughs> Because very often at a senior level, they are of the right stuff. They are good people, but they lose that disconnection, I, I sense, between that, con that control they have over the dynamic of what they're being presented upwards as to the way things are. So uh, the long sort of statement from me there, but I'm, I'm trying to get across a big, a, a big thing. There. I think you're, you're getting really into the issue of culture. Yes. Um, I, I, I think that what happens is that... Um, the people at the top end of the organization, one of their jobs is to make sure that the culture in the organization fits the, the purpose and direction that they're trying to take the organization in. Um, if you, um, you know, smile a lot, but are really still quite authoritarian, you know, you sort of want things done by Friday at three o'clock sort of thing, and, and don't mind pointing that out. Um, the culture becomes either rebellious and the organization fails or the culture becomes compliant and people kind of do not only as they're told 
but as they believe they're being told, even if they're not, <laughs> you know, they sort of, so you can build a compliance culture like that. But the most impressive leaders I've come across are people who try to build a culture in which they realize they're incomplete. They realize that, it, let's just deal with the top team for yeah. the moment. I'm not, not worried about the, the lower levels yet. But if I know, well, you, you probably know that I, I work with this three domain model of leadership, uh, which is about the strategic, the operational, and the interpersonal domains. And that's why, why it's hard. It's hard because <clears throat> it's hard to be equally good in all three areas. And there are some good reasons why that is, but let's not go into those now. But um, if you're, let's say, naturally a strategist, a natural, natural strategic thinker, and some people are, and they have a slightly torrid time when they're in junior levels because they're always trying to think about the future and the bigger picture and all of that. But they have to learn to do the kind of more anodyne things to, to get to those opportunities. So let's say you're a natural strategic thinker. The problem you've got is that you need the operational specialists and the interpersonal specialists <clears throat> to make your thinking complete. Not to come up with better strategic ideas, but when it comes to feasibility, if we've got strategic options to choose between, and I'm, I, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, is it better to go that way, that way, or that way, you need to talk to an operational specialist quite rapidly, because they will talk to you about feasibility. They'll talk to you about how to do the things that you'd like to do, and the things which the, which the, which the operation, which the organization as a whole, is more able to do more easily. And the interpersonal specialist will tell you what are people most likely to buy into? What are they ready for? What will they get behind? What, what will they resist? Uh, because they'll be more in touch with those things because that's where the, their minds are. Uh, and that's where their mindset is as well. So, so what I think about is um, you need to understand that as you get more senior, you don't need to become a strategist, but you do need to be a part of the strategy conversation. But you do it from where you are. So if you're an operator, you have, you have the operational part of the strategy conversation. If you're an interpersonal specialist, you have the interpersonal part and the cultural, the organizational part of the strategy conversation. But the strategists who are smart understand that they need those two contributions. They, they don't look to the interpersonal or operational people necessarily to come up with the blue sky thinking. That's what the strategists tend to do. But they do need reality checks. And that will come in two, two, of two different kinds and from two different places. Now, take the same metaphor. I've got a big jigsaw puzzle piece. The top team also has a perspective on what the organization needs to do. It needs, it's got a sense of direction and where they're trying to lead the organization. But everyone else in the organization probably are much closer to the customers. They're much closer to the everyday realities that that you're that when you're into that sort of rarefied atmosphere. And I too have sat around a FTSE 100 top top team table as uh, in the HR role, uh, two years seconded from my consultancy. Um, it gets a bit rarefied. You know, you can get you can lose touch with what's happening with everybody else. But if you if you build the kind of culture in which you genuinely believe that you need other people's perspectives uh, to inform you. Then, and if you're trying to build an innovative culture as well, you've got to be enabling as leaders. And enabling starts with enabling the conversation. So, so if you know, you're know you four levels below me in the organization, but you think I'm being a real plonker and going in the wrong direction, you've got to feel that you can tap me on the shoulder and say, David, can I just have two minutes of your time? And I've got to say, usually, yes. Yes. And that's, I think, the thing I see is the pressure of commercial imperatives driving, at, plus I think probably the shift with um, communication technology. Uh, so uh, WhatsApps, um, you know, e email, you know, I've got this little phrase, which is, you know, it used to be that people had to wait for you to return to work before they could have a conversation with you. Yes. you know, and that's now not, not the sense. So, and there's something now about there is, you know, the promise of technology was it would make life easier. The reality is it's really sped everything up. So it's the same expectation. Well, it probably it's a higher level of expectation so we can move faster. 
And it's almost a sense for me that, you know, that um, feeling of running down a hill and if you stop, you'll fall over. And I get this increased sense of momentum in organizations with greater expected timelines. That means you get good people who fundamentally believe in teams, trust, giving people space, et cetera. But because of the weight of the anxiety that they sit with, the biggest problem they have is how they give people the space that they had probably when they came up. And one person said to me, he says, I, I realize I'm robbing people of their experiences. He says, because when I was younger, if it went wrong, you had a week to put it right. <laughs> now you've got 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah but now every bugger knows about it within the hour and everybody wants an answer. So I now... Fear might be the wrong word. He said, I'm not sitting there in the cupboard gnawing on my nails, but I'm carrying this anxiety of there is very little buffer on, on anything. And therefore, he says, I don't think I'm autocratic, but my expectation is highly autocratic. <laughs> well, you, you, what you're saying, I think, makes great sense. What you're saying is I'm not autocratic, but I might be anxious. And what that makes me is potentially impulsive. Um, and, and, and also... Uh, I think that uh, there are very few senior people who, if, if you think about the job they held before they became, you know, sitting around the top table, the job they held before that, they probably are still amazingly skilled at, you know, and the person who's just uh, just been promoted into that job, still the, the top guy probably can do that job better than, than they can. But, but I think that they're there for your values, your beliefs, they, they really matter here. So the first thing I'd say, but let me say something about, about anxiety first. Don't put extraordinarily anxious people into really senior jobs. They will make life torrid for themselves and for others. Mm. At least don't do it without equipping them to cope. You know, coping mechanisms are, exist. There are ways you can learn to cope with anxiety. Um, and uh, so, so let's make sure that we're equipping even the chief exec to handle the pressures that he or she faces. Um, and be very, very careful if you know you're gonna put an extraordinarily anxious person into a top job, unless they are extremely intelligent and also uh, extremely kind of warm and accommodating, it, you're asking for trouble. Um, but the second thing I would say is, so let's, Ooh. catch me catch me having had too much to drink i'll still believe these things you know one people at the top end of organizations should audit their diaries from time to time and they should ask themselves what proportion of my time have i spent doing the things that only i can do they need to focus on the things that only they can do yeah and so you know the <laughs> Where that takes you is into a sort of counterintuitive space that work should always be done by the person least well qualified to do it, <laughs> provided they can do it. You know, in other words, you, you, you're, you're looking for, for, to keep as much at, at the right level in the organization and don't let things keep getting sucked up to the, to the top end of the organization, because then the, the, the limiting factor to growth becomes the top team, which is a, an irony. You know, because they're probably some of your most able people in, in any organization. But, but if you keep falling for the seduction, that oh, they need me to rescue this, that, and the other. I've got to go back to two jobs and you know, intervene over here. It, firstly, it, it is a seduction. It, it's an ego seduction. But secondly, it's completely counterproductive. If you spend you know, much more than about half a percent of your time doing that, you are robbing people, as you say, of their development opportunities, but also you're wasting your valuable time. Focus on the things that only you can do. Mm. So I really buy into that, that, that people who have that um, anxiety and can hold or carry that human reaction to the expectations that are put on on them there's also something else that i notice and it'd be great to get your thoughts on it which is just expectation so uh i'm not anxious i just have high expectation because i'm driven and focused and blah 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 
and I might be driven by the vision of creating a great organization, or I might be driven by the earnout with this private equity company. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are different factors going on that, hey, but I'm highly motivated, highly driven. I buy into the people agenda. You can only achieve things through your workplace and all, through your people. And then what I notice is that as society's commercial angst shifts, COVID would be a classic, you know, oh, if I lose my job, the market's really tough out there. Right. So that, you know, that everybody, nobody ever talks about Maslow anymore, but I go, well, you know, the reality is, you know, that, 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 that hygiene factor of, you know, putting a roof over my head and those that I love, that's, that's one of the ultimate fear factors that, you know, people have. So the, hum, the, the exec, the good people, they are driving towards a, a good end and they've got all their chakras aligned and they're, they're doing the right thing their quite acceptable expectation comes down the line and then we have a group of people who dependent you know where they are on the distribution curve of house paid off just got a new mortgage new kid on the way whatever it is and depending on what's going on in the world i sense have a greater level of fear around being seen to be valuable and through their own doubts and fears start to serve more than to be of service because they're holding that anxiety and that senior role likes the output <laughs> and and i and then i think what happens is sometimes you have a culture of fear but not by the intentions of the person at the top and i just wonder what your thoughts are about that as in you if you see it because then how does a good person with high expectation or a good team with good expectations, how do they then manage almost in some respects what people are doing to themselves, but then they become the arbiter of it because they like the output? I think um, I, I, you're talking about collusion here. Right. Um, and it's frequently unintended uh, and some, many times, you know, not even noticed until someone calls it out. Um, but I think I, that, that does bring me back to culture again, because I think that um, if I only ever talk to you about my successes, I do the thing that the social media do, and that is create this belief that everything I does, it, everything I do is wonderful. I never, I never fail at anything. You know, every party I ever throw, you know, is always wonderful, and everyone has a fantastic time, and I look fantastic. And, you know, I did my hair just right. Uh, uh, if I'm willing to talk to you about my failures as well, not, again, not over-egging it, but just genuinely saying, look, you know, I got this right, I didn't get that right. Uh, and if, if when we're handling feedback, you know, I say, when I did my work in the medical profession, I, I became known for some feedback rules, which just seemed to me to be so, so simple that, that, you know, why would anyone even remark on them? But, but funnily enough, the the so-called Pendleton rules exist, and uh, not not my intention, but they that they do exist. And it always starts with good points first. What what did you do well? And and that's not about being nice to people. It's about being effective in giving feedback. I want to know what you did well because many people say we learn from our mistakes. You learn a bit from your mistakes. You learn far more from your successes. Far far more. So I want to know what did you do well so that you can repeat it. And I want to know what you did well, not just in some sort of broad brush. Oh, well, you did it all very well, very, you know, well done. But I want to know in detail, what did you say? What words did you use? Where were you at the time? Who did you involve? You know, how did you, how much time did you spend planning? I want to really understand the anatomy of a success. I want to understand it in great detail. Then I want to look at something that didn't work so well, and I want to do exactly the same job. I want to understand, you know, what words did you use? Where were you? How long, how much time did you spend planning that? Who did you involve? I want to start to build the picture of a success, and I want to build the picture of something that's not gone so well, maybe even failed, or was suboptimal in some way. And I want to deal with them both, a bit like the Rudyard Kipling poem, you know, and treat those two imposters just the same. I want to treat them forensically. I want to understand them in great detail. Because then we can build this culture of saying, we either succeed or we learn. And that's not just idle words. We've got really detailed methods for making sure that one or the other happens. Now, you know, if, 
if you're dealing with some gross misconduct, of course you don't go down that road. You you, you might just literally instantly fire somebody, or yeah. you know. You, but but you know, 99 times out of 100, you're not dealing with that. You're dealing with everyday success and failure, um, and we all experience all of them. So the the culture needs to be analytical. It needs to be understanding. It needs to start by being prepared to forgive, uh, but not to forget, but to learn. So forgive and analyze. Mm -hmm. So you need to build those cultures so that people can, can face the fact that not any individual in, in any organization is perfect and totally equipped to deal with whatever it is they have to deal with. If we can get that idea, we, we'll, we'll find that we're, we're, we're human beings working with other human beings. Thank goodness for that. So when you're doing your work, um, David, how how would people, especially on a one-to-one -one basis, how would people experience you? Are these, um, because going deep <laughs> with somebody and having that forensic analysis, and that may be not the phrase that you would use per se, but uh, going beyond the superficial, let, let's say that. Um, what would somebody expect if they knocked on your metaphorical door and said, David, I'm a senior individual i'd like to move myself forward you know i'm great here don't know you know can't see the back of my own head all that kind of stuff blah 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 what would that intervention look like david i mean it may be different for different people but inherently what, what's the truth behind that for you well typically i start with a with a full assessment and uh, i'm talking about a psychological assessment here but what i what i start with so, so you know you come to me guy and say look i, I want to get better at what i do uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, why and, and, and what does better look like for you and all of the, all, all the things that a coach would do. But then I tend to take a detour into, will you let me kind of run a, a psychological ruler over you to see, I, I want to, I'm, I'm ultimately looking for two different kinds of strengths and two different kinds of limitations because they have different implications. Two different kinds of strengths. There are natural strengths. Natural strengths are where you've over time developed a skill set which maps very nicely onto your personality profile. In other words, you know, the, 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 natural, um, the naturally conscientious person whose pro profile shows the high level of conscientiousness, they've also learned to do project management and, and they've learned their, their, their planning skills and they're very organized and they've learned all the tricks of that particular trade. That's what I would call a natural skill there's a compatibility between who you are and what you bring anyway and the skill set that you've learned and are trying to deploy now it may be that you've got the attributes you need but you haven't yet mapped the right skills onto it so that would come out as a limitation but it's what i would call a potential strength You've got the attributes, you know, you're a, you're a seven foot athlete, but you haven't yet discovered basketball. OK, well, if I teach you basketball, chances are you're going to be all right. You know, that, that's a potential strength. You know. But there's another kind of strength that people forget as well. And it's what I call the fragile strength. A lot of people over the course of their careers, you know, you spent two decades doing what you're doing. There'll be some things that you do and you've learned to do to a reasonable level of proficiency but they've never felt quite natural. They've never quite become second nature. You always have to focus and kind of make yourself do them because you're working against the grain of the attributes that you've had since very, very, since you're very, very little. So those are what I call fragile strengths. Now, I haven't come to the fourth one yet. Natural strengths you can work with and hone and might even be able to become world-class at. Potential strengths are very high yield development activities. You can map skills onto your natural attributes quite quickly, quite easily. As I say, remember the seven foot athlete who hasn't discovered basketball, let's teach you how to play basketball. The fragile strengths, I'm afraid you're always gonna to have to work on because they, unless they do become second nature, it's always gonna feel like effort. So you've got to keep those up, yeah? Yeah. What about the fourth quadrant in my little two by two? It's what I call the resistant limitation. Some limitations, you haven't mastered them. And what's more, you're not terribly well equipped from a kind of natural attributes point of view. And I realized that planning and organizing was that for me, it was a resistant limitation. 
I'm moderately conscientious, but not hugely so. Um, but the problem is that I'm, I'm hugely curious. So when I'm trying to discipline myself to do something as Anodyne as sort of putting a decent project plan together, I get distracted. And yet one of the reasons that I think I'm reasonably good at coming up with ideas and doing a bit of strategic thinking from time to time is because I am curious about things. So if I turn that off, I'm afraid that I might be sacrificing a real potential or actual strength for something which is going to be rather low yield, frustrating development in an area that I also don't enjoy. So what do you do with those? So when I, so you say, what, what's it like if, if someone comes to me and says, David, can you help me get better at what I do? I start with a, a, a proper assessment. I go through um, a, a, a sequence of topics. We took a look at their current job. We look at their aspirations. We look at their interests and we look at their domestic circumstances about who's at home and what do you want for them? How do you handle the boundary between work and home and all of that? And then we go right back to early life. We look at childhood development experiences, education uh, and career to date. And that brings us back to the present day. So it's a kind of a circular tour around somebody. And what am I looking for? I'm looking for patterns. I'm looking for trends. I'm looking for explanations. So someone says, you know, I really work hard uh, and I want to think, well, OK, where did that start? When, you know, what, what, what feature does that have in, in this life story of yours? And what you then notice is that some people are trying to spin, spin you a yarn about the things that they're really good at. And there's no evidence for it at all. You can't see a, 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 any, a, any reason it should be there. You, you, it's not been mentioned by anyone in their past. You know, it's not had a feature in any previous jobs. And yet you're telling me now that it's true because, oh, and by the way, it's also in the job ad. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so so what I'm looking for is not to try and catch people out, but to understand them. I want to understand them from day one in as much as I can at that point. And interestingly, that process takes about three to four hours and we write it up, it takes another three to four hours to write it up. So it's a full day of consulting time to try and understand the person to that extent. And then we agree what we're gonna work on. But, but, but when it comes to a resistant limitation, I try to steer people away from working on that, but instead trying to work around it to say, who do you need around you to yeah. handle that for you? Because trying to develop you in that in that area is going to be a low yield, frustrating, slow progress, pulling teeth experience. Let, but, but, but let's by all means work on the potential strengths. I'm afraid let's keep up the fragile strengths and let's hone your natural strengths. That's that's how I start. Does that answer your question? Yeah, re yeah, that, that, that really helps. And in terms of um, profiling, do you sort of hang your hat on any particular assessments? I had uh, Rain Sherman on, who's the chief science officer for um, Hogan Assessments, um, just recently, and that was just interesting, just listening to his perspective on things. So, yeah, do, do you utilise an external sort of uh, system for that that you're comfortable talking about, and and, and why yeah. you may have selected that actually, because it's it's such a smorgasbord of, um, you know, uh, p p potential offerings in that field. I'm fascinated by what people use and why they've selected them. The Hogan measures are superb. They're excellent. Right. Um, all of them. Um, I don't use the Hogan personality inventory. I use the NEO. Okay. Uh, which is a five factor uh, mm -hmm. inventory. But, but we also use the Hogan motives, values, and preferences uh, index. And we also use the, um, the dark side measure, the Hogan development survey. <clears throat> um, so we're trying to do what Bob Hogan talks about look at the bright side, the dark side, and the inside of personality. Um, but we also use this semi-autobiographical interview as well. I like that a lot. Mm. Yeah, it's, well, it, it really works. I mean, I, I've found it uh, a pretty comprehensive set of, uh, of, of investigative measures. Um, and you know, what do I use the psychometrics for? Well, you know, Psychometrics are helpful, because, particularly the normed ones, because often people have beliefs about themselves, but they really can't judge how that compares with other people. You know, so as I, to, to quote one guy who should remain nameless, but was the most delightful chap. Uh, he was a general counsel of a big organization. And he said, I always knew I was a bit eccentric, but I didn't realize I was that weird. You know, it's because what he, what he had, I had to feed back to him was that he was right at the end of the distribution on a couple of things that, that made him almost kind of quirky 
Um, and he, he said he always knew he was, he was a, 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 bit, a bit different, but he didn't realize the extent of it. And that's what the normed measures can tell you. Um, and so um, those are the measures I use, but I am, I am a believer in the five factor model. And of course the Hogan personality inventory does that. Um, uh, interestingly, I think that the five factors are more obvious in the NEO than they are in the HPI, um, but I absolutely um, uh, love what Bob and Joyce Hogan did, bless her. And his, his, his. I'm, um... I, I, know, I also want to be careful when you bring other people's names up because you know if the other person has a different reaction to them it could go either way but i'm a bit of a jordan peterson fan and he Ooh. talks um so yeah if you're not then that's the end of that conversation i, I think jordan peterson is an interesting man I, I always think he's got a point of view that's worth listening to you know, i don't agree with everything he says but then i don't even <laughs> You know, day to day with everything I say, you know. <laughs> exactly. I'm very much in that camp. But I, I think just in terms of his verbal fluency and his absolute commitment to his the craft of his own understanding, regardless yeah. of what his position is. I mean, he's you know, he's he's got a, a verbal fluency and a rhetoric that people have obviously connected to greatly. I mean, but he, he's a five factor man. He's like anything else, he's kind of a waste of space, and I don't see well, the value of it. You know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that. Literally, you know, personality comes from the Greek word persona, meaning the mask, as you know, that, that, that Greek actors used to bring onto the stage to, to represent a different character. And literally since ancient Greece, people have been trying to figure out what personality is about. Well, personality theory has been all over the place for generations. I suppose it became kind of scientific in the early 20th century. I guess, I guess Ray Cattell and some of the statistical models, you know, helped with that. Uh, and through ISENC in the UK and all of that. But the, the truth is that um, people speaking about leadership, um, I, I started into the field of leadership literally at the turn of the millennium around 2000. And people, when they talked about leadership would, would stand up and proclaim that there are no personality correlates of good leadership. They're, you know, they just don't exist. And that's because of people like Stogdell and others who, who came up with these kind of endless lists of personal qualities. Um, and I still remember uh, Keith Grint running a session uh, at Oxford once in which he said, tell me the attributes you need to be a, a, a really effective leader. And people tentatively offered one or two things, you know. And by the end of it, he'd got about 50 attributes on the board. And so he said, so do you think anyone's got all those then? <laughs> yeah. And of course, the rest of it was clear. This is a council of perfection and you're all over the place. Now, all of that changed around 2002, 2004 with two really important papers. Timothy Judge came up in 2002 and said, hey, if you, if you get really clear about the, the leadership questions you're asking, and, it's, and they're only two, who gets a chance to become a leader? It's called emergent leadership. And how effective are they, are, are they when they get there? That's leadership effectiveness. So those are the two questions we're trying to predict. And let's look at the five factor model of personality, which are just come out about a decade earlier, I guess. So maybe I'm, yeah, I think I'm roughly right. Once you focus on just a few aspects of personality and only two questions to do with leadership, what Timothy Judge demonstrated was you actually can find personality correlates of leadership. Mm. And uh, Bob Hogan and colleagues uh, confirmed that in 2004. So uh, just a few years after I got into the field of leadership, a couple of really good psychologists said, let's focus on the five factor model. And as far as I can see, it's the one which seems to have the best empirical evidence base underneath it. Yes. There's a great consensus from most personality theorists that those five factors seem to work. And what's more, you get in, in my field of leadership, you get interesting predictive validity as well. What could be better than that, you know? I think that's, it's almost the point of, you know, if you chase too many rabbits, you won't catch any of them. And yeah, well, that's, yeah. just, exactly. it, I'm sure there, of course, there are other contributing factors, but there just has to come a point where you have to put your energy into what you, what you can handle. Yeah. Um, because I think the, the full buffet of, well, it'd be almost like saying, what makes a good parent? And then you list all the things on a flip chart and say, good luck. <laughs> it's because it's overwhelming, you know, all, all the things that you could put up there. So actually you have to say probably, you know, 
what are the five or six things that if you did those right, your kid will actually not end up as a lunatic <laughs> and as a contributor to society and just concentrate on those five? You know, so I, I think those kind of it, it, it comes to that capacity of the human being to be able to handle, especially when it comes to developmental things that people have a day job. They're not sitting there like I or you might be, which is giving the, the, the vastness of thought that we do from nine till five to these topics. So I've got to run a business. And I've got to try and develop myself. And that's why some of the psychometrics, um, it's like Myers-Briggs, for example, which I'm, I'm a great fan of. I think it works perfectly well. But if you try and bring a team into learning Myers-Briggs and the, the 16 variables and already they're like out. I mean, they understand it at the moment. They understand it in the moment, but trying to keep that flow going because there's, there's, there's just too much. And well, it becomes too much for them. Yeah, let's let's also be clear about these things. Um, the, the, there's good empirical evidence that diversity in a team mm. uh, makes the team is more likely to make the team more effective. Now, yeah. the question is, what do we mean by diversity in that context? Um, whenever we say diversity, people think race and gender. Mm. Um, but what they're forgetting is psychological diversity. Um, now, I, I, I have nothing against trying to get the race and gender distribution to be fairer than it is at the moment. Um, for me, the principal motivation around that is social justice. Um, if you want a team to be effective, um, however, you, you've got to bring in the psychological diversity. Yeah. So, so, and I, I, I still remember having put a number of uh, people in an exec ed program I was running in Oxford at the time through a, a number of psychometric measures. Uh, and I brought out two people and stood them next to me. And one was a bright, young, massively intelligent African guy who was black. And the other was a bit like me, a sort of pasty-faced <laughs> pasty uh, Caucasian. And I stood next to him and, and we started a conversation about diversity. And what I did to try and make the, 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 the um, discussion in a sense more interesting was that we, we talked about the obvious characteristics first um, but then I talked about um, the psychological uh, diversity issue and what it turned out was that the the, the pasty-faced other Caucasian bloke a bit like me turned out to be my psychological opposite and the the African guy turned out to be psychologically almost my twin so then we had to, a rather more complex conversation about what diversity means in that case. And of course, what I'm saying is, look, for all sorts of reasons, we want to encourage cultural diversity because that will also bring other things along with it, in, not, not least a sense of equity in organizations and in, 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 in society. But also we want to have the psychological diversity as well. And so what I'm saying is don't, don't stop short on the diversity agenda by going just to the cultural and gender ones that that's really important but please don't forget the psychological diversity as well um and uh, and that's you, you only kind of get at that by getting under the surface at, at the at the sort of um uh, psychological makeup oh i thought you were going to say under the skin there which would have been a perfect kind of metaphor for actually yeah. those those psychological diversities actually might be actually what an interesting thing what are we really talking about and if we made the conversation about you know like we're, we're, we all bleed you know we all bleed red right what are the things that are more true about us than are not and actually what conversations can we have that actually then almost join us rather than highlight the difference um, well, yes. i'm fascinated but, by that I think. yeah but please we always say, you know, we, we all bleed red, you know, under the surface, we, we share more, we, we, you know, we're all the same. Actually, that's not true in here. <laughs> under yeah. the surface here, yes. we're very, very different. Yes. And we've got to take that into account. And so the other thing I, I, I try to get... But it's shared, though, isn't it? it isn't, what I mean by that is, is your skin colour, maybe your skin colour, but your psychological makeup, though fundamentally your own, is still a shared truth. We are... We are made up of these variables. We are made up of these different psychological kind of preferences or, or traits or whatever we might want to call them. 
but they but we share the fact that we are that bowl of soup <laughs> and they all come out different and that is something that we can all recognize maybe maybe that's how i'm seeing it well i i i personally believe that it, it, it might be uh, as important for us to 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 shift our attitudes on that a bit mm. by saying you know underneath m most human endeavor there are normal distributions you know and 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 if we we're share that. Back, exactly no, yes. for sure. so analytically that's right yeah. but um, it, it does seem to me that you know just as there are tall and short people fat and thin people you know it, the, there are there are people who in leadership terms as I, to come back to the sort of three domains there are those who naturally gravitate to the strategic those who naturally gravitate to the operational those who naturally gravitate to the interpersonal domains and people bring different um, strengths to uh, any uh, leadership endeavor and what i've got to do is put a team together that's complete i've got to make sure that all the ba the leadership bases are covered um, and and therefore uh, i need to be um, I need to recognize that that kind of diversity cannot be left to chance. It's got to be assembled deliberately. And the reason is that because the world outside us is varying all the time and unpredictably, it, you've got to kind of, a leadership team is like a little Darwinian system. The selection pressures are varying all the time around us. And what I've got to make sure is that I've got this rich leadership gene pool, as it were, so that depending on how that leadership team needs to flex and change, so it can do so. So if I, if I recruit lots of people who are just like me psychologically, um, it, frankly, an awful lot of them are gonna be redundant because there's me anyway, you know, I, I've, got, I've got that base covered, but I need people who are not like me. Now that's very liberating on the one hand because you realize that you don't have to be complete. But it's also a, a challenge on the other because it means I've got to work with people who are not like me. Ah, you mean the people, not, people I always find like a complete pain in the bum? Yes, the chances are those are some of the people you've got to learn to work with because they bring the very attributes that you most need and don't have. Mm. And the reason that you find them challenging to work with is that they're constantly wanting to go left when you want to go right. So tolerance becomes much more psychological. <laughs> In, well, it, 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 for, for me, it's more than tolerance. It, it's need. I've got to t see myself as incomplete and therefore needy. And I've got to put the people around me who meet not just my needs, but the needs of the organization for complete leadership. So if we are a clock, I need that cog. I, I, exactly. Otherwise, the yeah. clock. Well, you know, um, Taking the clock analogy, you know, a stopped clock is right twice a day, right? Um, so, yeah. so I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm very conscious that if all I ever have is people like me around me, then we will, I, I will, there'll be some certain leadership tasks that we'll all absolutely enjoy no end, and we'd be really very, very good at. But woe betide the organisation that needs a different kind of leadership contribution, because I can't probably stretch to it. Uh, well, I can try it and I can fudge and I can, you know, make it look a bit like I'm doing it. But everyone knows that it's not really my natural game. So um, what, much better to have people around me. Now, if, you, if anyone's listening or watching this and, and thinking that this is all sounding a bit theoretical, let me tell you that, you know, I've worked with uh, one chief executive um, who stands out for me and I thought he was absolutely brilliant. He came... Peter Erskine, who ran O2 and tr transformed it from BT Cellnet into O2. He came to Oxford, uh, having um, sold uh, O2 to Telefonica of Spain, having transformed this organization. It was the most impressive story. And what he said was, I am uh, a very good marketer, but I'm not the best strategic thinker. So the first person I put around me was a really good strategist. And he happened to have, may I say, someone who uh, in his finance director was really, really good interpersonally. So what he'd done in those top three jobs is there was Peter who really was a deliver, deliver, deliver man. And this is what he, he, he told us. Uh, th there was the, the strategy director and there was the very interpersonally oriented finance director. They had all three leadership domains covered between the three of them. And they had other people in that leadership team as well. Mm. Um, and what's interesting is that the the finance director who was the interpersonal specialist was the guy who succeeded Peter when Peter left. But he'd understood this idea 
of he's really good at certain aspects of leadership, world class, and he needs other people to be world class elsewhere. And that's what he did. That's exactly the way he ran his team. Well, listen, David, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming super alert to time and um, recognizing that um, I could keep this conversation going beyond your patience. So <laughs> thank you for, for just some of your thinking. Uh, and it, it, it's been really nice just for me to offer some of my kind of frames of reference and just to hear your take on on that and your vocabulary around it. Um, it's uh, even simple things that you've probably said without thinking, just like leadership teams are quite Darwinian. You know, it's a simple phrase, but, you know, yeah, it's very true. It, it's it, it, and all these little things going on. So I've, I've loved some of the conversation that we've had. Um, so not because I want to stop, but, but I just feel that I have to. <laughs> it's, I'm going to say, David, thank you so much for just your time and contribution to this conversation and uh, this episode. It's, 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 it's been absolutely great to talk to you. My pleasure. So on that note, I'm going to press stop. Give me one moment.